would you imagine you're uh, on a flight across the Atlantic on a 747 and two men uh, come down from the flight deck with parachutes on and uh, <clears throat> the stewardess opens the door and they bail out and you say to her horror struck is this a hijacking and she says no no that's the pilot and the co-pilot they're they're have trouble with heights and they're dropping off in New York for hamburgers and and you sit back and you don't know what to think and you're just filled with fear and terror because you know there's no one flying that plane at all and your insecurity is incredible you just don't know what to do because you know there's no one in the flight deck and you know that thing's tearing along at five or six hundred miles an hour across the Atlantic now, any security you have in that plane depends on your trusting that someone is flying it and knows where it's going. And do you see that you're in the same situation if the pilot ever comes down, leaves the co-pilot at the controls, comes down and starts talking to the passengers. And he comes down your length and you start bombarding him with questions and asking them why, where we're going, how fast we're going, how high we're flying, and you start bringing out your own navigation aids, and you start ch ch checking up and finding out how it's going and what the wind, where, where the wind is coming from, and more and more asking them. And he says, no, no, you can trust, you can trust the co-pilot. And you say, no, no, but I don't trust, I don't trust the co-pilot. I want to know myself. And you can imagine that there is no relationship between you and the pilot. The pilot just says, listen, you aren't trained to fly this plane. You don't know how to do it. You have to trust me to do it. And any right relationship between you and him depends on your trusting him. Now, loved ones, we're flying far faster than five or six hundred miles an hour. And the spaceship is round and it's tearing through space. And do you see the same thing is true? You can't have a right relationship with the pilot or with the one who is guiding it unless at last you're prepared to trust that he is in control. And that's really, honestly, that's why so many of us have trouble with any attitude at all towards God. Because we just don't trust that he's in control. We keep on trying to find out how high we're flying or where we're going or how the thing is run or what it's going to end up as we try to do all that ourselves and as long as you continue to treat God that way do you see he'll feel the same as that pilot he'll feel you're just ignoring me you don't trust me at all you don't think a thing about me regard me as God you don't even regard me as a, a competent pilot and brothers and sisters that's why in these past weeks, God seems to have led us to emphasize that if you want a right relationship with your maker, you just have to trust him. You have to trust that he is the creator, that he's doing his job as a creator, and that he is in control. And moreover, that he put you here in the world with a certain plan for you. And he didn't just scatter us as salt all over the surface of the world. He has put you in a special place. He knows why you, he put you here and he knows where he wants you to go. And really, unless you have that attitude of trust towards the maker, do you see there'll always be a strain in your relationship with him? He'll always feel you're ignoring him. He'll always feel you're never acknowledging him for what he is. Now, that's why, you know, in, if you like to look at the verse, it's in Romans 3 and 22, uh, that truth is stated in, it's page 979, 979. It's stated there in Romans 3 and 22. <coughs> the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And that we are justified by our faith. And we're made right with God. You see, we receive rightness with God when we put our faith in him and trust him. And if you're not trusting him, you'll never be right with God. 
And you can try in that 747 to become a brilliant pilot by studying while the flight is in process, but you'll never, you'll never get any relationship with the pilot unless you trust the pilot. And so it is with the Father. Unless you trust God. That's why you could begin a relationship with your maker this very moment in the theater. Do you see that? You could change from an attitude of distrust and skepticism and a desire to run your own life to an attitude where you at last say, well, Lord, you are in control. And I'm going to start trusting you as the maker and the creator and the God of my life. That's why we say you can become right with God this very moment, you see. You don't have to go through a whole long process of lots and lots of preparation classes or church membership classes. You can take an attitude, adopt an attitude of trust towards your maker today, this very moment, and say, Father, I've been wearing the whole thing through on my own. I've been living as if you aren't there. I am going to start trusting you from this moment. And God counts your trust or your faith as righteousness. Now, what we have been finding out is that it's not just one act of the will, but faith and continued rightness with God is a continuous attitude all through our lives. You know, it's a daily attitude towards God. And that's why I think many of us who have made one commitment of ourselves to Jesus at some meeting or other, that's why many of us have begun to lose out spiritually. We've begun to feel insecure in our relationship with God. We're not certain what he thinks of us now. We're not certain whether we're right with God. And we've fallen into all kinds of attempts to prove ourselves to our parents and our professors and our teachers and our pastors and to anybody who will listen to try to show that we are really good Christians. We are really children of God. And the reason we've fallen into this is that we have not continued to walk daily trusting God. That's what it means, you know, when it says the just or the justified people, the people who are right with God, live by faith. You just live by faith every day. And that's why we were, you know, talking about this these Sundays. Some things about living by faith and how you live by faith. Now, maybe it would be good to see one more this morning. Faith isn't self-deception. Faith isn't self-deception. Faith is not turning your eyes from reality. Faith is not auto-suggestion. Faith is not the power of positive thinking. That's not living by faith. There are certain groups of people who say, now our present predicament of war and famine and spite and jealousy and racial hatred and cancer Our present predicament is due to people not believing there's a God in charge of the universe. Then they take the next step and they say, therefore those things themselves, since they're due to believing a lie, they are lies. And so there are some people who say, cancer doesn't really exist. Don't believe it. War doesn't exist. The pain in my head, it doesn't exist. It's not real. Now, loved ones, that's the power of positive thinking. But it isn't faith. And yet, you see, that does achieve some results. Because there are psychic laws that govern our mental life that bring about some results. My mother used to say, you know, take an aspirin, and if you don't believe in it, it won't do you any good. That's right, didn't do her any good. But when she believed in it, it did her good. Yeah, yeah. And it is true that faith has a power in itself. If you believe a certain thing will do you good, probably through psychic influences and effects, it will affect your body in some way. So there is a power in the power of faith, but that kind of faith is not the faith that makes us right with God. Faith that makes us right with God is not an illusion. It's not a running away from reality. It's not a pretending that the things don't really exist, even though that kind of thing gets results. That, of course, leads to a certain attitude if you believe that faith is that. It means that you'll have to keep your eyes off sickness, you know. If you are sick and you have headaches and you have high temperature and you ask God to heal you and uh, the symptoms are still there, then if your faith depends on looking away from reality, you'll have to keep looking away from that headache. You'll have to keep forgetting it all the time. 
You'll have to keep avoiding the reality that is there. That's, I think, what gets many of us into trouble, you know, with, with very down-to-earth parents. There we are without any money, and we keep saying, oh, we're trusting God, we're trusting God, you know. And they say, yeah, but you haven't any food on the table today to eat. And we say, well, that doesn't matter. We're forgetting that. We're looking away from reality. No, faith looks at reality and sees it as it really is. Really believing faith. The other kind of faith that is the power of positive thinking or auto-suggestion is always weak in the face of big problems. It's strong in the face of little problems, but it's weak in the face of big problems. And it's always struggling with facts, you know. Uh, somebody, you remember, asked, uh, Paul Little says, somebody asked him, uh, asked what is faith? Uh, asked the little fellow, what is faith? And uh, the little fellow said, it's uh, believing something you know isn't true. And, you see, you're always in that kind of struggle if faith for you is avoiding reality, saying the facts aren't real. If you have a broken arm and you keep saying, no, the arm isn't really broken, you see. It isn't really broken. It's a result of believing the lie that God is not in charge of the universe, so it itself is a lie, then you're caught in that business of faith as an illusion, as a self-deception. Now, loved ones, faith is not that. Real faith recognizes that believing the lie that God does not exist can bring about real results in our world. Cancer is very real. You can see the old cells. Somebody dying from an incurable disease, that's very real. That's not an illusion. Now, I agree with you that it results from believing the lie that God is not in charge, but it itself is very real. So, you know, if you worry and you don't trust God, Okay, the ulcer is very real. You can see it on the x-ray. It's there. Uh, if you don't believe God is in charge of your home and your family life, and you're always straining against each other, and you create hypertension in each other, that blood pressure can be measured on instruments. Now, faith always looks at the facts and sees, yeah, they're there. Faith looks at those facts. Real faith. Now, that's what our verse says, you see. And it's maybe good to see that plain. That faith is not afraid of facts. It isn't involved in illusion. Now, maybe we should look at the verse that, that states this. Romans 4 and 19. And it's the verse we've come to in the exposition of Romans 4 and 19. The RSV translation reads, You remember Abraham had received a promise from God that he would have a child. Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was way over 90 and uh, 19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now, the Greek reads this way. He did not weaken when with his faith he considered his own body. Now, do you see that Abraham looked at his own body, which was about a hundred years old, with faith, with eyes of faith? Now, it's not faith, you see, to see the mess in your dormitory and to see the strain and tension with your roommate and to look away from it and keep saying, no, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it's a lie, it's a lie. That isn't faith. Faith is to look at that and see it but to look at it with faith. And so real faith looks at the facts and looks at reality as it is. Why? Because what it sees confirms the revelation that God has given us in Jesus. The revelation that God has given us in Jesus says this, there's a law of sin and death. You ran your world independent of God, God withdrew his life from you, the result was disease and sickness and strain. Same thing with the ulcer. You turned away from God, you did not depend on him and trust in him, so he couldn't give you his spirit of life any longer, so you dwelt in worry, and you created disease inside your own body. Same thing with the hypertension. Same thing with the promiscuity. You looked away from God because you thought, no, I have to have this, I have to have this satisfaction, God cannot give it to me himself, so you involve yourself in promiscuity, so you produce a child, and the child has the results of that lack of faith. The child has the results of that in the, in the body. Now, do you see that faith looks at the facts and sees, yeah, 
these facts confirm the explanation of reality that God has given us in Jesus. That the war is here because men have not trusted God. So faith actually feeds on the fact. It doesn't turn from reality. It looks at reality and says, yeah, this is the result of us not trusting God. Now, that's one vital thing that faith does. And that's why we read that story of Gideon. God actually rubbed their noses in it, didn't he? I mean, he rubbed their noses in the facts. They had several thousand men who might have won the battle with a little help from God, but God wanted to show them, look, these facts are are a hopeless situation. You can do nothing with them. I'm reducing you to 300 men. Now what can you do with 300 men? And God really said, look, I want you to look at the facts and see the reality so that you realize the power of the miracle that changes this. And so, brothers and sisters, those of us who walk by faith do not walk looking away from reality. We look at the facts. Now, I agree with you. We look at another set of facts. Because you remember, if you're in the 747 and uh, you're really finding difficulty believing that it'll really stay up there, you eventually have to get past the point where you can't afford to look down. If every time you look out the window and you see nothing underneath, you keep saying there's nothing underneath, it must be falling. If every time you do that, you'll never come to a place of security in that plane. You have to look at the fact that there's nothing underneath you and yet that there is a new law of aerodynamics that supersedes the law of gravity. Now that's what a Christian does who walks by faith. He sees that as there is a law of sin and death, so there is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that's mentioned Romans 8 and 22 if you look at it. Romans 8 and 22. So a person who walks by faith looks straight at the fact. But then he sees that there is, sorry, it's Romans 8 and 2, verse 2, page 982. He sees that there is another law. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So you come in to the headache that you have with the flu. You don't pretend the headache isn't there. You don't keep saying, yes, yes, in Jesus I'm whole and well, in Jesus I'm whole and well, I have no headache, I have no headache. You look at the headache, but you look at it with faith. And you say, Father, this headache is part of the disease, the lack of ease that has come upon the whole world because of our lack of trust in you. There would be no germs in this world if we had not rebelled against you. There would have been no dirt in this world if we had not reacted against you and run our lives independent for our own sakes. Now, Father, I know that these things have come as a result of that. But I know, too, that Jesus has borne that death that ought to have followed my sin. I know he has already borne the death and borne all the disease that leads to that death. Now, Father, I know that there's no reason for me to bear this death. There's no reason for me to bear this disease because Jesus has borne it for me. And you begin to see the other law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That because Jesus has died in your place, the Father is making available to you all the power of the Holy Spirit that was available in the Garden of Eden. And that new law is beginning to operate and is beginning to work in your life. Now you can see it, you know, in Isaiah 53, it, the translation, we don't often look at it, but it's in the footnote there in the RSV, Isaiah 53 and verse 4. See how it reads, uh, page 634, 634. Surely he has borne our griefs. And then do you see the X index there at griefs and look down to the other the translation of the Hebrew or sicknesses. Surely he has borne our griefs or our sicknesses. And then the next line and carried our sorrows. And there's a Y index there. Do you see down at the footnote or pains? And surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. And that is the re deeper reality that the Christian sees. He looks at the facts as they are, but he looks at a stronger set of facts that are true in Jesus. He does not keep his eyes blind to the facts that are here in the world. He looks at them strongly, but he looks at them with faith. And he sees a stronger set of facts that are present. Now, there's an illustration of it, you know, in the Old Testament, if you look at it. Second Kings 6 
and 15 through 17. Second Kings 6. It's page 324. 324. Second Kings 6 and 15 through 17. Elisha was the prophet and then this was the servant that God is talking about in verse 15 of Second Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was round about the city. Now those were the facts that he could see in front of his eyes. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And then Elisha said, He said, Fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, walking by faith means seeing the facts as they are before us, but seeing the other set of facts that is able to reverse those facts. So a Christian who walks by faith doesn't walk blind to facts, but he sees a stronger set of facts that have already been made real in Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see that faith is not self-deception? It's not looking away from difficulties. It's not looking away from the business that is failing. It's not looking away from the bank account that is low. It's not looking away and pretending that the studies aren't behind. It's looking at those, but looking at them with faith. Seeing the age of Sarah's body, seeing how old your own body is, and realizing, boy, this is going to take quite a miracle but seeing it in that light. And do you see, that doesn't steal glory from God. The other steals glory from God. If you can persuade yourself, this isn't really as bad as it appears. If I keep my eyes off it, I won't really be aware of it. Like a little fellow, you know, closes his eyes, says, all I can see is darkness, there's nobody here. There aren't 600 people here, I can see nothing. And that's what many of us are like, you know, in trying to exercise faith. But real faith sees the facts as they are, sees that they are reality of a kind that have resulted from believing the lie that Satan is in charge of the world and God is not. But then we see a higher set of facts that in Jesus, God has already exercised the penalty of death against us all and he doesn't need to do it all over again. And his only desire for us is perfect health, all the money we need, all the health we need, all the, pl- all the things that he really believes we need. Now, there's only one thing that's important to add to that. In God's time. In God's time. Do you see that? In God's time. If you're trying to walk free of that flu, and the old headache is blasting in there, and you've gone through all the exedrin and all the distrin, uh, and all the, the headache is still there, and you're walking, walking, believing that Jesus has borne this sickness for you, you ought to hold to that. But you ought to say, Father, when it is your time to remove these symptoms, I'll accept that. I'll accept your removal of the symptoms when you please. But I thank you that in Jesus this has already happened. But you don't keep pretending, you see, that the headache isn't there. Somebody says to you, you have a headache. You don't say, no, no, I have no headache. (laughs) And they say, your nose is running, and you don't throw away the box of Kleenex. You see, no, no, you say you're dead right, it's right there. But I know that the real fact is that this has been born by Jesus on Calvary and that in God's good time he will lift these symptoms from me when he pleases. And it's that way, dear ones, with the studies and with the bank accounts and with the jobs and the businesses and the home situations and the family situations. You don't look away from reality, you look at them straight in the face. But you look with faith, as Abraham did. With faith, he considered his own body and Sarah's body, both of them as good as dead. And yet he looked at them with faith, knowing that God had promised that all that he needed would be given to him. And so he continued to trust that. So, you know, when the old chariots are gathered round you, then you have to look at the horses and chariots of fire that are gathered round you in spiritual forces and believe those and believe that set of facts over against the others. So Christians are people who look at the facts, but look at the stronger set of facts that are in Jesus. So, you know, I know it's all tricky and difficult, but 
But I really pray that the Holy Spirit will lead some of you into walking that way. You know, Because it is possible, brothers and sisters, to change the world by faith, really. And to change your personal world and your family world and your academic world and your social world by sheer faith, just by believing this set of facts that God has re revealed to us in Jesus. And it is possible for changes to come about. So, you know, I said this one Sunday before, and one brother came up afterwards and said, you know, a week ago I really did change my way. And I saw changes coming about in my own life. And so, would you take something in your own life, something that isn't right, that isn't the way God wants it, and would you begin to exercise faith about it? Don't pretend it isn't there. Say, it's there, right there. I can feel the effect of it. But take a position of faith that God has reconciled all things to himself and therefore has reconciled that thing to himself. And therefore, as far as he is concerned, that thing is already solved. And begin to thank him that he is now working on lifting the symptoms off. Would you begin to do that? I, I wish you would in the dormitories, you know. Those of you who are really struggling it out with some roommate, it really would be a lot better if you'd begin to believe that roommate under the control of God's Spirit, instead of fighting them all the time. You know? And really, in regard to your material well-being for the summertime, if you take a stand in regard to it, say it's there, Lord, you can look at the bank account, there's nothing in it. Yeah, that's plain. I see that. But Father, I know that you have a different set of facts and that I am in Jesus and that everything is available to me in him. And begin to believe that. Well, I pray that he'll give you that grace, you know. I know it's rough at the beginning. But really, if you take even a little step on it, then the next step is easier. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that only your Holy Spirit can make real to us what walking by faith is. But we would trust you now, this morning, to bring before us something in our own lives that we need to look at straight and plain and stop pretending it isn't there. And we need to see that it is real. And that Satan's lie has worked a real result in this world. But Father, we know that all of this has been reversed in Jesus. That Satan's whole claim to us is that you have to destroy those who have sinned. And we know, our Father, that Jesus has died for us and you don't need to destroy us anymore. And so Satan's claim has been nailed to the cross. The legal bond that stood against us has been destroyed. And we know, our Father, that you're our loving Father that you have nothing against us now because of Jesus. And you will give us whatever we need. And we can trust you absolutely, not only to fly this machine, but to guide every part of our lives. And so, Father, we look to you now, and we trust you to begin to work in these very real difficulties that we see in our lives. And we trust you now, our Father, to reveal the complete reversal of them that you have already worked in Jesus in the eternal realm and make that real here now so that we can see it too. And we will trust you, Father, for your time. We now just take a, an invincible stand against these things and trust you now, Father, to reconcile everything to yourself in a way that people will be able to see so that you will be glorified in our lives and your power will be made clear to those who don't believe in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.